Welcome to Inner Compass. I'm Karen Salpi. Here in the United States, our attitudes toward nature have shifted over time almost as much as nature itself. Our guests today help develop the intriguing field of environmental history to track the intense relationship we've had with nature. And he'll tell us about the patterns he's noticed today on Inner Compass. From the campus of Calvin College, this is Inner Compass, exploring how people use faith and ethics to guide them through critical issues of today. My guest today is Donald Worster, environmental historian at the University of Kansas, an award-winning author of several books on how America's history has been shaped by its natural resources. Welcome, Donald. Good morning. Um, Edmund O. Wilson said that humans are hardwired to love nature. Uh, do you agree or disagree? I don't know whether there's enough evidence yet to argue that, but it is certainly a powerful theme in world history that people feel a passion for the natural world, they feel a part of it, mm -hmm. uh, and they always seem to want to need some kind of nature in their lives. Whether it's universal and a scientific fact or not, as Wilson claims, is still up in the air. Yeah, I want to believe that that's true, and it's certainly true for me, but I've met people who would rather die than go camping, <laughs> so I'm not sure. Um, there's also uh, um, maybe a myth, maybe truth, that I grew up with that, that Native Americans, before Europeans began to settle, um, had a real respect and, and reverence for nature. Is, is that the case? Certainly it's the case, uh, but they're not the only people in the world who've had a respect and reverence for nature. And Native Americans did things in the natural environment that don't look to us very respectful. Tell me about that. Um, well, driving bison off a cliff as a way of killing them, watching them pile up at the bottom with broken backs and necks in order to get a meat supply doesn't seem to us very reverential. Right. But there are ways of even doing that that are full of reverence, and, uh, and it's also a practica practical necessity. They need to If you eat. don't have horses and you don't have a way of killing these big, strong animals, uh, this may be the easiest way to do it. I've always thought of Native Americans as, as kind of low-impact people. Uh, there is an argument that they were responsible for the extermination of a large number of large mammals. Really? About 10 or 12,000 years ago. Native Americans had an impact through burning, use of fire in the landscape, which had a, an effect on vegetation. So I mean, that's not probably the full extent of it, but that they had an impact on the land they lived in, and sometimes an adverse impact, I think, is pretty well established now. Okay. At least until very recently, all cultures who've come to the United States have depended on the landscape, have depended on nature mm -hmm. for their sustenance. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about different kinds of attitudes toward, mm -hmm. toward that relationship? Your, your whole study has been of the relationship between humans and nature. Well, the immigrants who came over the last 500 years have basically all come out of Europe and Africa until very recently. We don't know very much about African attitudes that were brought over on the slave ships. That still is an area that needs a lot of investigation. But if, as far as white Europeans are concerned, they're basically coming out of a Judeo-Christian background. So we're asking, you know, what were their religious roots and how did those influence their environmental behavior? They're also coming out of a culture that is moving towards modern economics, towards capitalism, towards industrialization. And they're bringing those seeds with them to the new world, which means that they're looking for commodities to sell, to exploit. They're looking for ways to grow their economy, all of which have environmental implications. So even the white Europeans are a complicated group of people. And, and different religious traditions within Judeo-Christianity have different attitudes. Tell me more about that. Uh, we can read Genesis and, and some translations have us know that we're to subdue the earth or have dominion over mm -hmm. the earth and some other translations tell mm -hmm. us to be stewards of the earth. How, how traditionally has that passage been read? I think the people, who, Europeans who came to the New World found in the Bible whatever they wanted to find to support their views. Which was? Well, for the most part, they were interested in subduing the land. Mm -hmm getting domination, getting the economic value out of it. They were hungry for resources. They had been running short of resources in Europe. So they fell on the new world with incredible appetite. And it was easy then to quote Genesis and say, have dominion and subdue the earth. But that verse can be taken in many different ways. 
Uh, you can have dominion in a very passive way. Just sit on your throne and look, look passively at the world mm -hmm. and, and enjoy it and admire it. Give a few names here and there. That's very different from putting a dam in a river, you know, or plowing up soils and so forth. Uh, so I think the Europeans who came had, uh, on the whole, a pretty aggressive attitude towards this new world. But at the same time, as they're here for decades and then centuries, it's hard not to develop an incredible love for the beauty of this continent and the, and the bounty that it has before them. Well, it looked like there were unlimited resources. Every, if, if you yeah. ran out here, yeah. you just moved a little farther west. And, uh, yes, uh, indeed. They celebrate this from the beginning, the plenty and the abundance and, and the beauty is part of their Im impulse. Uh, they feel an aesthetic reaction to this place again and again. Do you find uh, in your research evidence that there, that there were people even in the earliest days of Europeans settling here of, uh, of wanting to conserve places? Were there, were there parks? Did people create preserves mm -hmm. uh, that, that weren't going to be uh, plowed or, mm -hmm. or cut down? That doesn't really start until after the Civil War. Yellowstone National Park is our first. It was established in 1872. Why? Partly, I think, uh, because Americans were very much worried about the economic impact that they were having on the continent. So they were starting to recognize. They were starting to worry about this. People like Thoreau had been writing earlier, people warning about forest depletion. The Yellowstone was also exceptional to these people in, in these strange features and so on. They couldn't really see any economic purpose there but they saw that there was something quite extraordinary in these hot springs and so it wasn't just for beauty. It's places of beauty abounded all over the place, but it was a kind of strange freak in a way that they wanted to preserve. But the, but the, and then I think there was also after the Civil War a feeling we needed some way to bring the country together into a more unified, harmonious relationship. And where better to do that than to go out into the natural world Nature was a kind of healing place to go after the Civil War. So Yellowstone, Yosemite, these are our first two national parks. And I think both of them were born out of a mix of motives. Commercial, railroads wanted them to bring tourists To have tourists a destination out, for tourists? To have a, a destination for tourists. Um, but also people saw these things and said, these ought to be preserved for future generations. I've always, on, on a kind of smaller note, I've always been kind of awestruck by the existence of Central Park in New York mm. to take what would be, I don't know, unfathomably valuable land now mm -hmm. for, for industry mm -hmm. or commerce and, and to turn that into a park that's, that continues to be preserved. It took some persuasion. Uh, an editor at a newspaper in New York who was also a great nature poet uh, wanted to bring nature back into the city didn't see any reason why nature should be excluded. You know, New York was laid out on a rigid grid, right. which looks completely mechanical and artificial. But there were people who felt you know, it was too rigid, too artificial, and they wanted to bring nature back into the picture. The area that, that became Central Park was a kind of wasteland at that time, rock, too rocky to build on, right. full of marshes and wetlands, full of shanties where poor people had moved oh, okay. uh, and had become a kind of slum. So this really was an improvement on that land? They that thought point. it was an improvement, but at the same time, you could have improved it in other ways. And so the idea of bringing a wilder feeling environment into the city, which was this, the, the design that Olmsted, Frederick Olmsted mainly came up with, uh, was in an effort to heal the, the, the breach between urban man and woman in nature. Right. Humans have had an impact on their landscape mm -hmm. forever. Mm -hmm. But the Industrial Revolution, I would guess, accelerates that to a degree that that that, that cause that that maybe that causes mm -hmm. a breach that hasn't existed before. The Romantic movement uh, among artists and poets and so forth in the 18th century is is kind of a feels like a backlash mm -hmm. to all that, right? So how many of these movements were shaped by art and literature and music and so forth? The, the arts shaped. Uh, our attitudes toward nature remarkably. I mean, all up and down the spectrum of, of opinion, from the l 
most lowbrow arts to the highbrow, uh, nature became a theme in painting, landscape painting. I, th I think the legacy of our great landscape painters in the first half of the 19th century was huge in terms of shape, reshaping people's attitudes. Tell well, me about some painters. Tell me about some artists. Well, the, the most famous are people like Thomas Cole and his fellows in the, in the Hudson River School, going up the Hudson River, which was, and still is today, one of the most magnificent rivers on the con not only in the continent, but in the world. These great highlands, people said, this is as good or better than the Rhine, which has been so celebrated in poetry. And began to paint that, to paint the White Mountains of New Hampshire, other, and the sea uh, shores, the seascapes, and saying, look, Americans, this is a gorgeous place. We've been after it for money. Mm -hmm. But there's something here beyond money. And people began to buy these landscapes and eventually we end up with national parks. I mean, there's a direct connection here that the artists, mostly visual artists, but, but also poets and essayists like Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, had on reshaping people's imaginations. They didn't stop the onslaught of this capitalist industrial revolution that was chewing up the landscape, but they were able to slow it down, save some places that, that we still cherish today. How important was John Muir in all this? And you've written a really important book on John Muir. Um, he was criticized as an effeminate nature lover, um, but, but he sure had a lot of power in shaping our attitudes. He was a giant in terms of reshaping American thinking, but at the same time, John Muir was probably as much made by the public as he made the public. Uh, the public, I'm, t I'm speaking particularly about the American public, although he later took on an international audience, needed someone like him. I mean, there was a sense that we need, the Americans needed someone who could stand up and speak for nature. Urban people wanted someone who could tell them what nature was like, how to see it, uh, who wrote with enthusiasm and color and, and passion about the natural world. He became an American prophet, and prophets are, you know, as much made by their followers as they make themselves, but he let his beard grow really long, <laughs> his hair grow long, he had this kind of gaunt face anyway. He looked like a prophet come down from the mountains. So to he bring, knew how to work the image. Thing. He knew how to work it very much <laughs> so. He would never cut his beard uh, as he went on in life. Uh, he was the founder of the Sierra Club in the 1890s. He wrote book after book that, it became, that became nature classics, most of them on California and on the West, Alaska. Uh, so he had a huge readership. Magazines in the United States wanted him to write for them. People came to California to meet him. The President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, asked him to go with him to Yosemite National Park to camp and talk. So he became quite a celebrity. Uh, his persona was, was known all over the country. And as a consequence of that, he had a political impact. What he wanted to see happen was the setting aside of large parts of the American wilderness, the landscape, the wilder landscape, and, and to see those preserved as a kind of religious sanctuaries for the country. And, and that began to happen. Did it help that Teddy Roosevelt already had a heart for that, or, do, or was that partly shaped by Muir's influence? Muir certainly furthered that impulse. Teddy Roosevelt was being pulled in many directions. He was being pulled by the business community. He was being pulled by his friend Gifford Pinchot to set up a national forest system that would exploit the forest in a more rational and wise, sustainable way. And he was being pulled by people like John Muir towards wildlife and wilderness and so forth. So Teddy was full of all kinds of contradictions okay. on this matter. But Roosevelt certainly was, was convinced by Muir that Yosemite Valley needed to become part of the national park system. He was convinced by Muir that the national parks needed to be expanded. And that happened during Roosevelt administration. Teddy Roosevelt ended up setting aside more public land for preservation than any president until Jimmy Carter. But you've written that ours is essentially a mining economy. Can you explain that, that concept? A mining economy is basically um, one that assumes that we will always find 
new resources someplace else to make up for what we've depleted here. Most obviously, we're a fossil fuel-based economy. So we know that's a mining economy. Yeah. Our whole energy system is based on mining. You can't replant fossils. You can't replant them. Uh, it'll take several hundred million years to get new ones to grow. So the idea is we'll use it all up and then we'll find something we'll else We'll find to something use. else. That's mm -hmm. basically a mining economy. Mm -hmm. And so far it has worked, but it hasn't been tried very long. Uh, even today, the United States is increasingly importing its natural resources from elsewhere. We invented the oil industry, but where is our oil coming from today? Not from our own lands. Production in the United States peaked in 1970, oil production. We'll never get that back again. Uh, so that's a mining economy, and the question is how long can it keep extending its reach into the world before other nations say, hey, we want to keep those resources at home for ourselves. What are the trade-offs there? I mean, th uh, there are those who say, let's drill some more in the United States. Mm -hmm. It's there offshore, it's there mm -hmm. in Alaska and so forth, so let's go get it. And, and there are others who say, no, we don't want to destroy the, the landscape in order to find that oil. Mm -hmm. um, what's your feeling on that? Well, I, I think we can safely drill in some places, we ha or at least the land will recover in some places, but we are increasingly pushing our drilling into very vulnerable habitats and places like the North Shore of Alaska. We're, we're taking enormous risks the farther we push our drilling in the United States. There are easier and safer places to drill on this planet, though, though we're going to run out of them soon. So the question is always, how, how far are you going to push the ecosystem, the right. planet, uh, in order to get a few more barrels of oil out of it. So what happens when we start looking for alternative sources of energy? Are, do you see that, we're, that we always have been and always will continue to be a mining economy or are there alternatives that would be more sustainable? There are alternatives that might be more sustainable, wind energy and so forth, but there is almost no way we can continue to produce energy on the level we are producing today uh, and, the, and the waste of energy that we are uh, experiencing today. All the alternatives that I know about are going to require us to conserve and change our energy consumption habits. We're not going to go through the kind of bounty that we've had in the past. We're going to have to be much, much more careful and efficient about everything we use. So it's not just that the energy is unsustainable, our patterns of use, the economic system we've built up, the consumption patterns are all unsustainable. That's the problem we're up against. It's not going to be just finding a nice green source that will continue to allow us to do everything we want to do. What got you into this field? I was just raised as a good farm boy in Kansas. Uh, so I think the reading of people like Rachel Carson, Aldo Leopold, Henry David Thoreau was really vital to my own education. When I was in graduate school, however, in, in studying history, I didn't see that historians were paying any attention to this. They were still talking about politics, mm -hmm. uh, power. They were talking about increasingly about social history, family relations and gender and so on. Race, of course, is a big theme. All of this quite important and interesting. But where was the environment in any of this? Historians seem to have decided that environmental matters belonged to the sciences and had nothing to do with history. And as far as I could see, that was that was ridiculous. And you were especially interested in the Dust Bowl, the history of the Dust Bowl. Tell us about that. I became interested in that because I grew up on the right. Southern Plains. Well, during the period of World War I into the 1920s, American agriculture plowed up tens of millions of acres of native grassland on the Southern Plains. And by the 1930s, a huge swath of land, perhaps a third of the landscape in the Southern Plains, was open to the wind. It was plowed country. We'd been raising wheat and bumper crops. In the early 1930s, continuing into the mid-1930s, drought hit that whole area, severe drought, one of the worst droughts in a couple hundred years. And the wind began to blow, and pretty soon we had on our hands one of the worst environmental disasters in human history. People have forgotten how widespread it was, how devastating it was economically. Um, people began to look around the world and see that we weren't the only place producing dust and dust storms. But nonetheless, the, the scale of wind erosion in the United States at this point was unprecedented. 
It told us that something really quite severely wrong was wrong with our agriculture, our government policies, our economy. It happened to coincide with the Great Depression. So it was a it double whammy mm -hmm. for people living there. So we required a huge uh, change of thinking about our relationship to the land, our expansionary culture that is always looking for more, to produce more, uh, our attitude towards marginal lands that were very vulnerable. And the New Deal of Franklin Roosevelt began to try to come up with remedies and solutions and we didn't get very far, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, it finally ended essentially because it rained. The rains came back, World War II occurred, and we were off in another whole cycle of expansion, et cetera. And that's been, to some extent, the story ever since. So does history teach us to avoid repeating our mistakes, or does history teach us to be creative, or does history just tell us that we're always going to be faced with surprises and challenges? All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all of the above. History does teach us some lessons, and we learn them, and we put in reforms. I mean, this is how change occurs throughout time. People are responding to the environment as much as anything else. When resources are depleted, people learn to do things differently. They make new technologies, but they're always surprised. And sometimes they're surprised by the solutions that they found. The solutions didn't work the way they were supposed to work, and they're surprised by that. Give me some examples. Well, the, the issue of the automobile would be a perfect example. Um, in the late 19th century cities, manure was everywhere. You know, horse manure. Mm -hmm. Dead horses were everywhere often. I mean, we had a huge sanitation problems because of our transportation system, which was based on animals. There were flies everywhere. There was fecal matter in the air. People mm. were breathing as it dried out. The automobile looked like a perfect a solution. solution. Yeah. You know, you burn a little bit of gasoline, you drive around, you get rid of all of these animals from the cities, the streets are clean. You know, by the 1940s, we're discovering smog in LA. We're discovering that this technological solution turns out to have even more problems, perhaps, than the manure and the dead horses. So that's a kind of, that's a kind of story that goes throughout history. Yeah, so maybe the answer is just to keep moving, not to stick with anything. Well, you have to keep so innovating. You yeah. can't stand still. Nature does not stand still, for one thing. Nature's always hitting us in the face with things we didn't expect. And increasingly over the last few centuries, we are doing things to nature whose consequences we have no idea right. about. For instance? Biodiversity. At what point do we exterminate so many species that whole systems become unstable and we begin to do ourselves great damage? Water is another one, fresh water systems, the whole hydrological sphere of this planet. At what point do we push our fresh water supplies beyond the point of recovery? And what will that mean for us? I mean, there are eight or nine of these kinds of global systems, environmental systems, that are almost too complicated for us to understand. Hmm. But we need to attend to them. But we need to understand where, as much as we can, where the tipping point is in these systems. I mean, there are other moral issues about future generations and about our relationships to other species and so on that are important here as well. But just in our own self-interest. Right. You know, in schools, we need to understand how the earth works. But you're a historian. Are you optimistic <laughs> that people can, can I'm come I'm fairly optimistic and, yeah. these days, actually. I think there's a lot that's happening all over the planet, not just in the United States, but all over the planet. And some places, some ways, other countries are in advance of us in thinking about how to change their ways of life. So I'm fairly optimistic about that. I'm not optimistic about our ability to... to um, prevent the loss of tens of millions of species over the next four or five decades. I think we're going to go through a holocaust there, and we don't know what we're losing mm -hmm. um, because we don't even know what is out there. I'm not terribly optimistic about our ability to stop climate change. In fact, I think it's already begun, and the momentum behind it is so strong that it's going to be impossible for us probably to change very quickly, especially in the United States, and especially when we have politicians who are even denying that there is a problem. So our best hope really is to figure out how to adapt to the change. Well, that's about all we have at this point, to adapt and to mitigate. 
That isn't to say that we shouldn't be trying to do something because it can get worse and worse and worse. But there are many other things that we are doing and doing well. We are innovating in energy. Uh, we have certainly, in the United States, passed great endangered species legislation that is probably working pretty effectively within our country, at least. I think Americans of all ages understand the principles of ecology much better than they did decades ago. And most Americans continue to be concerned about these issues. No matter how they vote, they are concerned about the issues. They understand that these are serious matters for the future. So that, that's a good reason to be optimistic. And this country has uh, an incredible legacy of caring about the natural world, celebrating it, the, to draw on. And this country has an enormous streak of creativity to uh, address problems. So those are reasons to be hopeful, I think. Thank you very much. My guest today has been Donald Worster, environmental historian at the University of Kansas and author of several books on how America's history has been shaped by its natural resources. I'm Karen Salpi. Thank you for watching Inner Compass.